Welcome to the Relate Church Podcast. I mentioned that we are hearing from a few different people this morning. We have three different speakers, and I wanted to just encourage you, church family, to help encourage them, if you would. Here's the thing, is that each one of our speakers today, when I asked them to speak, they all just kind of responded with a yes pretty quickly, which is unique. Um, and it's not because they were just longing for the microphone and waiting for their opportunity to be up here, but because I believe they have a word, a message, that God has been speaking to them, their song of the summer, if you will, that is for us as well. So today, you are first of all going to hear from Allie, who is leading worship this morning. She's going to come and speak. We are then going to hear from Francisco, who happened to be on guitar this morning as well. We're just doing all the things. And then you will hear from Lily. All of our speakers this morning are significantly younger than me. Um, and we love hearing from the next generation. And they're not just young. They um, are full of life. People who are serving and showing up and part of the church family. And I feel very proud of them for being willing to share this morning. So I want to tell you that it is a, a unique experience for us to get to lean in and listen as they just courageously bring a message. They each have 10 minutes. It will be relay style, and then they'll pass it off to the next. But would you guys help me out by encouraging them as they come up, and we'll just cheer them on um, and just make them feel at home and comfortable as they share this morning. I am believing that each one of them has something that we really need to hear. So we will start with Ali. Will you come and bring the word this morning? Sorry, Rod. Uh, no pressure, right? Um, by the way, you guys did sound great. Um, I don't know, hopefully you're not paying attention to me when I stand up here and you're worshiping, but it sure sounded like it. Um, it was beautiful to, to hear that at the end. Just gonna unlock the iPad. Oh. There we go. All right. Um, the nice thing about, I guess, being up here is it slightly lower than the platform behind me. Um, but unfortunately, you also feel two more feet of atmosphere and it is weightier. And so I will say it is a privilege to stand up here before you guys today. And I'm really glad <laughs> that I don't feel as nervous as I did this morning. Um, I like being right. I don't know if anybody else relates to that. Um, I was the youngest child by seven years uh, and then nine years for my sister. And so when I was little, they were always right, obviously, because they were 10 and 12 and I was three. Uh, but whether it is having the right answer to a question or advising a friend, whatever it is, I like being right. There's something elating about it. And we're trained in our society that we'll be rewarded for having the right answer. On a test, you get an A. If you get the wrong answer, you fail. Uh, TV shows, entertainment like Jeopardy, there's a cash prize for having the right answer, but that cash gets taken away if you have the wrong one. We're in a society that places so much importance on being right and being the best that we, either actively or subconsciously, pursue it, I would say, obsessively in one way or another, in whatever it is that we want to be the best at, that we want to get right. Jobs, performance-based. School, performance-based. Social media, performance-based, how many likes we can get. Our entire lives revolve around meeting a standard. I had the privilege of attending a Christian high school, um, and so for my 11th and 12th grades, I was part of the worship team. It was like an extra Bible studies class that I would take, and one Sunday, we had set up stations around the school, and our homerooms would, would go, and they'd go to each station, and, and each, you know, there's like a little group of each of us that would run these stations. And we played a video and it was something about, you know, capitalism taking advantage of underprivileged people in developing countries. And afterwards I said something to the effect of, I know it can be difficult to believe in God when we see these horrible things happen, but, but Jesus, but the role that God has called us to play. Um, but I had one of my peers who was running this, this station with me come up to me and say, like, why did you say that? Like you lead people. Why on earth would you ever confess that you doubt? 
or that you do something wrong. I took my role seriously enough that I felt so guilty and it would carry with me for years before I unlearned it. But I began to subscribe so wholly to this unattainable idea of who I was told I needed to be that I needed it to appear that way. Fake it until I make it. So in my own recovery from that and other toxic theology, if it's toxic, it's probably not theology, I've witnessed or heard stories of many people who have also shared this ingrained need to be right or to be perfect. And when they didn't deconstruct, at their most extreme, they either became militant in their theology and faith, I am absolutely without a doubt correct, or they left the church altogether. And I realized that a significant cost of pursuing a human standard of the perfect Christian instead of God himself was to varying degrees, either the conviction of personal revelation or the ability to be authentically revelatory in the world. That its impact is pride, anger, and fear. And even though it's in the effort of being good Christians, you simultaneously can become a poor Christ follower. Now, deconstruction, it's a fun word. People in church love that word. No, they don't. Um, because it can cause some unease as it's often related to people leaving the church. But if you look at a house and you look at deconstructing a house, what you're doing is taking away drywall, you're taking away all the things that make your house look pretty, and you're looking at the things that it needs to stand up, and you are reevaluating those things. Whether it's beams or columns or plywood or whatever it's gonna end up being, sometimes those things need to get replaced. Still with a beam, still with plywood, but new. And so as I witnessed these people who stayed in church yet became unwaveringly staunch in what they believed in their understanding and their perspective, I'm prompted by one of the earliest verses I'm sure many of us have memorized, which is Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6. Um, this is the message version, so it's not the version I learned as a kid, but trust God from the bottom of your heart don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do and everywhere you go, and he's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume you need it all. You know it all. See, the need to be perfect often comes from a fear of failure and a fear of a loss of control. Maybe it's that until we actually are perfect upon entering heaven, we must at all costs appear to be that way. That was me. <laughs> or perhaps worse, because we need to have some sort of say in whether or not we will get to heaven. And so we need to feel a sense of security when we do doubt. And yet, that means trusting our own abilities and our own understanding. And while the grace of God is still on offer, because we know that he is gracious until the very end, we, get to miss, we would miss out on the peace that the relationship with God has to offer. So what could be better than allowing God to strip away the facade, to remove the pieces that cover up what we're ashamed of, where we're wrong, and instead entering a space where he can make us aware of the things that don't serve us, but more importantly, don't serve him. That strip away an ingrained need to perform and appear to be perfect so that we can truly come before him as we are. That intersection between knowing the truth of the Bible, but simultaneously being open to the movement of the Holy Spirit to reveal new truths is where we engage in true worship. John 4.24, it's who you are and the way you live that count before God. Your worship must engage in the spirit, in the pursuit of your spirit, in the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people the Father is looking for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before him in their worship. God is your being itself, spirit. And those who worship him must do it out of their very being, their spirits, their true selves, in adoration. It allows us not just to come before God and encounter him, but leave changed such that we can go into the world as revelations of who God is, with the confidence and strength of spirit to encounter the unknown with God knows. And instead of engaging from a position of, I will do what I think is right, we can go in with, I will be who I know I should be because of who he says I am. And that means we might be too kind. 
and people who don't deserve our kindness will receive it. We might be too generous, sorry. <laughs> so generous that it hurts. But someone that couldn't pay rent and the bills will suddenly be able to afford both and you will see God in turn provide for you. Someone who feels invisible will feel seen. Someone who feels alone will know community. And someone who was rejected will know love. And wouldn't participating in creating a world like that be so much better than the thrill of the fight to convince ourselves and everyone around us that we're right? Hebrews 11, one to four. The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors, set them above the crowd. By faith, we see the world called into existence by God's word, what we see created by what we don't see. By an act of faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice to God than Cain. It was what he believed, not what he brought, that made the difference. That's what God noticed and approved as righteous. And after all these centuries, that belief continues to catch our notice. I found that people who carry shame will often look at stories and histories, and though especially the ones that resonate with them, and think, oh, I better not do that. You know, we look, we look at Moses, and he was fearful before the burning bush. We look at Joseph, and he was a little arrogant towards his brothers. Abraham and Sarah doubted. So in turn, we should not be fearful, should not be arrogant, should not doubt. But I think what their stories offer instead is look at how God used imperfect people with imperfect actions and understandings and saw beyond those things to their heart and saw a desire to be loving, to be kind, to be generous, to be faithful, to be good, and decided that those things were far more important than being right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Francisco, and I'm very honored and excited for this opportunity. Uh, before I tell you the name of my mixtape for the summer, I want to start with a little riddle. So if you know the answer, please wait until I say so, so you can say it. So the subject I want to talk about is something we can see, but it's always around us. We can touch it, but we treat it like a property. We ask for it, or we want to give it. It's not money, but we usually refer to it as invested or done wasted. It cannot be saved. It cannot be accumulated. It seems to rule our every day. Uh, but still, we struggle to understand what it is. Uh, it's there to wake us up every morning, and then it's there when we go to bed. And finally, just to, as a final clue for this riddle, could you please extend your left hand forward? Okay. I'm going to drop the mic for one second. And with your right hand, could you hold your wrist? So most of you, what is it that you're holding? Most of, most of you have a watch in there. So the, the subject I want to talk today is time. To be more specific, it's the wonderful gift of time. And just as a little kid, if you receive a gift, would you please repeat after me and go, wow, wow. So this is today's um, summer mixtape. And the reason I want to talk about time is because it's my intention to show you that the way we understand time determines what we do with it. So there's two questions that I would like to um, talk about. The first one is, what is time? We're so used in our culture to thinking about time in many different ways. So if you could please fill up the blank. Time is? <laughs> Most people would say money, right? So it's interesting how we see time as money. Because if time is money, then we treat it as something that is always limited. We're always running out of time. Even if, as I have a timer, we're always running out of time. We don't want to waste time. We have limited time. And if we had limited time, then we ought to make the most productive things out of it. And we always have these little boys in our heads telling us, you're not doing enough, you're not doing enough. 
come on, rush, rush. And we're always in a rush, we're always in a hurry, and we seem to never have enough time. But if we look at the Bible, instead of our social media, for what time it is, do uh, you remember in Genesis when God created time, right? In day number two? Really? It's not there. <laughs> we see that it says in the beginning. It doesn't say, and then God created time. Time is an, uh, an extension of an eternal God. And it says in day four that he created the lights and the stars to be signs for times and seasons. So we don't see time as a creation, but more like uh, a way of us to refer to events, how things change, how seasons happen. And when we go to the book of Ecclesiastes, I hope that's in that right. Um, we say, we can find Solomon, who basically achieved everything in his life. He was a king, he had power, he had money, he had everything you can think of. And when we ask him about time, he says, it's all vanity. It's in vain, it's transitory. Uh, and if you're like, oh, that's so disappointing. <laughs> you wanted something better. But the reason for him, it is vanity, because he says, I apply my heart to know wisdom and to know badness and folly. I perceive that all, is, all of this is also striving after the wind. So if I go like this, do you think I'm holding time? No. We're always chasing after the wind, trying to hold time. Um, but if we see time as a gift and not as vanity, in Ecclesiastes we also find that it says, for everything there is a season. And later, later he says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. So time, uh, we can find many definitions, but I want to show you that time is a gift. It's a gift from a good God, a God who is an eternal God. So instead of always running out of time, we are living, uh, enjoying the present, but we're aware of eternity. So I want you to please, again, extend your left hand, hold the time with your right hand, and I asked my wife to, for this example, can you come, everyone say hello to Sophia. Okay, so extend your left hand, you're holding time. This is the good gift of time. Can you actually hold and open the gift? No. My intention today is we have to let go of time to actually receive eternity. When we let go of time, we see that it's a good gift from God. You can take that gift. <laughs> so, uh, and the second question is, what do we do with it? Instead of always chasing the wind, when you receive the gift, we go, whoa, right? Like little kids, could you say, whoa? whoa. So I want you to actually go, W, W, O, I mean, and W. Wow, that's what we do with a gift. The first W is worship. Jesus said to the woman in John chapter 4, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father. And Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. So as the first thing we do when we receive a gift is we're thankful for it. We recognize that he's a good God and we worship for who he is, for what he has done. And the second, the O, is obedience. Why do we need to be obedient? Because then we don't live worried about these things. We seek the kingdom of God first. Uh, in Matthew number six, when he talks about, do not be worried about these things, uh, he says, do not be anxious about this. Uh, other people, those who do not know God, are always worried about this. But your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Sufficient for the day, it's its own travel. So we obey. As we receive this gift and we worship, we also obey in two ways. We obey but not being worried. That means we're not always, uh, as the time we're this little uh, oppressing thing in our lives, we don't, we don't worry. We believe that it's a good God who is eternal, so we don't worry about what a second is. Um, and then we also seek the kingdom of God first. That's the best thing we can do with this gift. It's by grace, we freely receive it, we also give it to others. And the last W, wanna see Ws please? Yeah, is wonder. We live in wonder. We enjoy the present as the present it is. 
We are amazed by those little things. And just as Solomon before, that he said that everything is chasing after the wind, after he did everything he could do in life, he said, there is nothing better for a person that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toll. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, um, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? So at the end is we worship because we are grateful for this gift. We obey because as we receive it, we can also give. And we wonder, we enjoy the little things in life. And why is this my summer mixtape? In my case, I'm from Colombia. So if you don't know, that's a beautiful country, uh, but it doesn't have any seasons. So coming here to Canada for the past months have been exciting. You get to see how things change. But as a person who's not used to seasons, I don't like change. I like to hold on for dear life to my watch and beg that things don't change. And it's been a big struggle learning to know that um, there's a time uh, for death and there's a time for life. That there's a time to let go of my past with a thankful heart and there will come a time for me to worry about tomorrow, but I have to live today. I was constantly chasing after the wind and I can tell you, you cannot open the gift with one hand if you're trying to hold on to time. It's only until we let go of time that we can enjoy eternity. Um, so please receive this good gift from a good God, from our Heavenly Father, and receive it with woe. Could you please say it one final time? Whoa! So thank you again for your time. Um, and let's just have a thankful, for, a thankful heart for the God who is good. And I hope you can enjoy this gift and don't let time rule you. But enjoy the time as the gift it is. So you can enjoy it with others. You can enjoy every single day. Um, and next time you're always just looking at your mirror, at uh, your watch, sorry. You just remember what is actually time for you. Thank you. I feel like I need to say, whoa, just as I walk in. I'm going to get my notes. Hello. Um, my name is Lily. I serve um, on Sundays normally in our kids' classes. So this is just a different environment for me. I'm a little bit nervous, but excited for what God has to say, really. I have been wrestling because I knew this day was coming for a while now, and I've been wrestling like, God, what do you want me to share? And I, I heard him tell me, and I went, mm, I'm going to wrestle with this more and figure out something better and more comfortable, and then I'll get back to you. But as I was preparing for it, literally I had written it down in different notebooks. I had put it in my phone app, and he just kept directing me to this one little phrase. And I was like, OK, <laughs> I'm scared, but I'm going to do it. Um, yeah. So I think I just, yeah, anyways, I wanted to just share a thought on praise and something that has just been kind of the song of my summer, if you will, is just this phrase, praise isn't easy. And I'll expand on that more. But I wanted to read, to start off from Lamentations 3, verses 22 to, to 33. And it says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him bury his face. Oh, my screen glitched. In the dust, there may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to the one who should strike him, and let him be filled with disgrace. For no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. A bit of context to Lamentations. It's the prophet Jeremiah lamenting, crying out to God, He's filled with sorrow for the fate of those whom he dearly loves. After complete and utter devastation, 
These are pain-filled, sorrow-led words. I think sorrow is a place some, but more likely all of us have been. The searing sting of loss in whatever way, the way it fills our lungs, we can't breathe. Moments of solitude, silence, where you're reminded of just how alone we truly feel. A forced smile, a forced answer to, how are you? But there's something important here though, because Jeremiah was crying out to God. He was worshiping God. And there's freedom found in worship, in crying out to God. It's upside down and at best inconceivable how it could be, but there is joy found in worship, especially in times of sorrow. Freedom isn't the absence of suffering, it's the absence of not being alone anymore. Or sorry, worship is, isn't the absence of suffering, of being with God. And as Jeremiah knows and said, though he brings grief, he will show compassion, so great is his unfailing love. And let me tell you, God's compassionate love is unlike anything. It's life-changing, healing, restoring, unending. It's what we need. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. That is the gift. To know God's grace, to know how far he has brought you, to begin to understand the depths of his love for you. And I wanted to share just a little bit of my personal journey with that, my personal experience of God's unfailing love towards me. Um, I've walked through very dark seasons in my life and experienced tremendous loss that no one should, doesn't make sense. In separate seasons and in separate times of my life, I have experienced relational loss with both of my parents and the grief and the weight of that is tremendous. And in the midst of all of these highs and lows of all of this loss, I made some really bad mistakes. And I said things that were hurtful to my parents, to my mom, that I can never take back. I did things that were shameful. And there was a moment where I was feeling the weight of that, feeling like this is all my fault. In light of all of this loss, I feel this shame and I feel to blame for everything. And I sat outside of my house because I couldn't sleep. And I just started crying, crying out to God, feeling this tremendous weight. And in that moment, I, I felt God reminding me of his mercy, reminding me that where I sit, wherever I be, that's where his mercy is. It follows me. His goodness, his mercy follow us. If there's anything I could say, an anthem of my life that I could share, it's this. Keep looking to God in everything. Keep seeking him. It's everything. Hold on. Rich Mullins, a Christian artist, said this, and it's always stuck with me. You need to hold on to God for dear life or let go for dear life. In other words, what can you let go of to then cling to God, to look to him? Because only God can give us the strength for this, for this life. This is the place we are meant to be, even in places we were never meant for. Life is a challenging journey this side of heaven, but we have the maker of the heavens and the earths with us. But you might be thinking, how do I do that? How do I keep seeking God? How do I keep bringing him praise when I have barely enough energy to wake up every day? What do I do? How do I pray to God when I'm soaked in tears and I can't, I can't cope? Well, you invite God in, that's the first step. He's not concerned with how much strength you have or what you've sorted out for yourself. He's got the strength, he's got the power. 
I tend to simply just say his name like a breath. Jesus, God, Lord. Invite him into that space with you. That's the first step. And then continue to feel the grief, cry, lament. This does not scare God. He doesn't push him away or lose his interests. God is Emmanuel, God with us. Being with somebody is not a partial commitment. It's a permanent posture. And that's who our God is with us. Express what is on your heart as a surrender. Let him know. Seek his face and praise him. Thank him. Worship softens our hearts because it points us to God who is love. And this isn't just like a step-by-step way in how to get better. It takes time. But I invite you to say his name when you're in those times. And on the other side of that, on the other side of sorrow, there is blessing. And sometimes, in a twisted way, we, we won't ever understand, but sometimes the blessing initially might look like a wound. In my life, I've experienced so much loss. But on the other side of that, on the other side of my surrender, I've also experienced the deepest joy and blessing in ways that only God can. And it's beautiful. And that's the gift for all of us. If we would just look to him, we would find him already looking at us. So I want to invite you, if this is stirring something in your heart, or if anything that was spoken today is stirring in your heart that you need to, to repent of, or maybe you need to look to God, or look back at him, would you in your heart just, just make that decision? And we're going to head into a time of worship and communion as well. Um, and our team will also be up for prayer, but if you made that decision, I want to just pray for you. Holy Spirit, we are seeking your face because it's the only thing that we need. We need you. We'll let everything else be surrendered. We will let go for dear life and cling for dear life to you because you are good. I thank you, Lord, that you are, uh, your spirit is ministering in all the ways that, that people need it today, God, that there would be healing spiritually, mentally, physically, Lord. We would experience healing in this room, in this place, Lord. That you'd be igniting a fire inside of hearts that will never burn out because it's you. It's your spirit, Lord. And we thank you for the gift of mercy, of praise, of looking to you and finding ourselves already found. We love you, Lord. Thanks for listening to this week's message. If something stood out to you, if you'd like to submit a prayer request, or if you'd like to learn more about how you can get connected, email relate at relatechurch.ca. If you'd like to partner with us and our community initiatives, please visit relatechurch.ca slash give. It's been an honor to spend this time with you. Catch you next week.